Hello, everyone. This is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you could also find me on the ConsciousResistance.com and SeedsOfLiberty.com. So today we have Daniel Hawkins, um, who is a writer. Uh, he's written articles. Uh, one of them is called Anarchy Never Been Tried. It's a six-part series. Another one is Freedom is Unconstitutional. And freedom is free. Um, I assume primarily on the Art of Not Being Governed website, right? Yes. Primarily, yeah. So, so he's also um, admins of. Uh, he's an admin of uh, Art of Not Being Governed on Facebook. Vacate the state. Vacate Wall Street. Fuck the Republic. Um, and the Turncoat Resource, which um, is particularly um, uh, dear to me, because he's the one that brought me into this whole, you know, being an admin idea which is pretty cool thank you very much daniel <laughs> um and uh, and since then i've uh, started to admin other pages but uh but yeah so <clears throat> he's been he's an admin on a bunch of pages um so yeah we'll uh get into that and hopefully you know talking to family members uh, or not talking to family members <laughs> about volunteers <laughs> whatever the case may be so uh so daniel um uh so just uh, can you uh tell us a little bit about how you became a volunteerist um Yes, I, I could. Uh, it wasn't, for some people, I guess it is this kind of like all of a sudden type thing. For me, it was never that. Um, I started out as a conservative. Um, I always had a more like radical bent, I guess you could say. Um, definitely, like I would, I would, I definitely did consider myself a constitutionalist. So I was always, you know, the constitution and limited government and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then it just eventually led to uh, learning about Ron Paul and just being dissatisfied with the field. And then in 2012, uh, seeing Ron Paul just lose, like go down, you know, uh, just crash and burn and everyone just stomped on him basically. That was part of that process. So um, completely abandoned the idea of conservatism. And it was about that time that I started uh, listening to Stefan Molyneux and Adam Kokesh and uh, reading Murray Rothbard and Tom Woods and uh, Lysander Spooner. So it was all kind of like this coalescing type snowball thing. And then I just ended up like, okay, I'm a volunteerist. So that's that's like the logical conclusion. So so that was in 2012. Was that 2012, Ron Paul's, or 2008? Uh, 2012. 12. Awesome. Yeah, I, um, I usually like to make the confession just to let people know that I'm fallible, that I, I voted for Obama in 2000, when was that, 2008. <laughs> I'm revoking the card. But the only, the, the only reason is because I hate, I well, I was indifferent to politics up until then. I really didn't care. I was focused on other things, you know, my acupuncture, herbal medicine, Eastern nutrition, you know, I was really into that stuff and and uh and my family is fiercely democrat democrat so so who, who am i going to vote for democrats of course you know so, of course. Why not? so i i participated in my own enslavement and enslavement of my neighbor i, I can admit that freely now <laughs> um but um so so i i, I um i know that you are so you're 20 years old right i just want to make that clear because yes. that's uh it's not so not so common that we meet such young anarcho capitalists, but it's a beautiful thing, you know. It's I think it's um, it's it shows some uh, some optimism for the future that uh, the, the younger generation is embracing the freedom philosophy, yeah. and uh, you know venturing out and uh, breaking the chains of their um, of the dogma and propaganda they were fed because you went to public school as well, right? I assume. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. So why don't you why don't you tell us a little bit about your public school experience? Is anything sticks out in it? <laughs> uh, I mean, like. Just <laughs> it just was a grind. It's all it felt like was just this grind. Just every day, it was just so monotonous. And uh, a lot of my classes were just like, "Why? Why am I even learning this? There's, this has no bearing on my life. I'm never going to need this because I know what I'm interested in." I understand, you know. Part of it is, at least on some level, they want to give you a variety. I mean, because they kind of have to, otherwise, parents would like freak out but the level of depth they go into in completely irrelevant stuff <laughs> is just and it and it just makes people uninterested and they hate it um but then i kind of i kind of realized as i i mean i was never okay with the idea of public school being a conservative 
um, starting in about middle school, high school, I was like, this is absolute BS. Um, and I learned about um, a lot of the Prussian schooling, you know, the history of public school and stuff. And then one day it just kind of like dawned on me. I was like, this isn't like an institution. People, a lot of kids that I was with kind of thought of public school as this like thing that's always been around and it's always going to be around. And this is just something that everyone does. This is what you do. You get up and you go to school and then you go home. And that's like part of their lives. Like it's ingrained in their psyche. Like this is part of what you do. And then one day I just figured out, I'm like, these are just people. Like teachers are just people. This is just a building someone built one day because they were told to. And, you know, obviously, you know, with the tax money and everything. And I just kind of realized, like, this is not, this is something that can be uh, abolished, you know, like anything else. It's just, it had, because it has a real power on, on students. And I, I figured that out, that it was like this this thing that was just in their heads like it was like completely necessary i find it um fascinating that when i when i talk to people about volunteerism and uh, you know the possibility of living without government a voluntary society um they cite um history or slanted history that they learned in government school as a rebuttal and 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 and, and they don't see the contradiction that you know, you're using a source that is funded by government stolen funds oh, yeah. <laughs> to oh, defend government. Yeah. And and you and I realized this in probably middle school um, that McGraw Hill and uh, uh, a lot of Prentice Hall, you know, uh, textbook companies, uh, usually based out of uh, Texas, they have a vested interest in whatever the government tells them to print. It's, they're not printing things for the sake of academia. This isn't like this isn't you know uh, for for enrichment or anything. This isn't to try to make you smarter. It's to tell you this is the curriculum. This is what you're learning. That's it. That's all you're gonna learn. Um. So. Yeah, and uh, and and I was just listening to a, a a Tom Woods podcast today, and and he was saying about how uh, there was a a guy that he knew that. Um, that was where he was a private uh, publishing company uh, that that supplied textbook, you know, history textbooks to the to the public schools, and uh, and he would and occasionally he would get calls from like uh, you know the State Department and, and they would call him up and say you know please remove the Armenian genocide <laughs> like uh, yeah <laughs> because yeah. he's like we don't want to anger our friends in Turkey, right? Oh, so. of course. Like, you would never <laughs> want to anger your friends in Turkey. Who just, you know, if they're journalists in Turkish prisons, there's a name why they call them Turkish prisons. Like, yeah. it's, oh yeah, just of course, because, you know, our, our interests, American interests, you know, like, you want to protect American interests, don't you? Of course. Uh, yeah, and, and it just, it just is really, um, like, eerily reminiscent of, of 1984, you know, censoring of the, yeah. the news and the history, and it's just, <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not so outlandish as people think, you know, it's not just no. in 1984. <laughs> um, I, read, I read Harrison Bergeron in middle school, in sixth grade, uh, by Kurt Vonnegut, and it blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind. And then in high school, I read 1984. I've been meaning to do it for a while, but uh, it was required reading. So, of course. Uh, <laughs> which is just the, the epitome of irony. Yeah, it is, of, isn't it? <laughs> I read 1984, and I read uh, uh, Brave New World. So those were kind of the uh, the dystopian kind of stuff, uh, classics. Anymore, they're reading, like, Hunger Games and stuff um, in a lot of high schools and middle schools. Which, again, was the epitome of irony. Like, oh, 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 they're reading hung, the Hunger Games. You said no. Yeah, they're reading, they're reading Hunger Games. They're reading uh, uh, Maze Runner. They're reading um, some newer kind of like dystopian stuff. Wow. But I've seen, I've like heard teachers teach this, and it's like they're dancing around stuff so bad. They dance around everything so bad because they'll they'll frame all their questions like as in what's wrong with society, mm. and they'll always be like. So how do you think society changed? What do you think this book is saying about society? Yeah. But they will never ever say, what do you think this book is saying about government? Yeah. <laughs> they'll never do it. <laughs> or they'll be like, does this book really say that democracy is good? 
because you know basically they'll just in the end they'll be like well the message is that we should have a democracy yeah right of course of course <laughs> yeah democracy is uh again i was listening to tom woods he was saying uh he was saying it's it's a choice between the stupid the stupid party and the evil party right and sometimes the they get together and they do something that's both stupid and evil <laughs> <laughs> yeah basically yeah it's just been a world history for five thousand years and, and democracy is something so uh magnificent that we simply must force it on the rest of the world because they have no idea what's good for them <laughs> right? yeah i mean of course i mean you're talking about like what did greece turn into in you know a pretty short amount of time and what did rome turn into in like 300 years empires yeah because you know democracy it's good it's, it's for everyone it's, <laughs> it's for everyone <laughs> yeah yeah and uh and the other thing is uh, secession is um, is you know the essence as as Lincoln even said right secession is the essence of anar- anarchy right <laughs> which yes. is yeah, man. I should have quoted that I should have quoted that <laughs> in my article in my Scotland article man that would have been the best I had these other quotes in there and then people <laughs> well, why do you go why do you go into that you, you, the uh, the article that you, that you wrote okay so uh, I think like a year ago. Um, I wrote this article uh, called, um, I think it was like, what Scottish independence means for anarchism. I'm pretty sure that's the name of it. It's on uh, the art of not being governed. Um, so Scotland, if you're unfamiliar with this, uh, Scotland had a vote uh, on whether or not they'd be independent from the UK, uh, specifically England, because that's basically where the seat of power is in Westminster. So... It was, it was basically, they already have their own parliament um, that has a pretty decent degree of autonomy in Scotland, but ultimately they defer to the British crown, like to the, well, I shouldn't say the crown, but to the British government. Mm. Um, so they had this referendum to see, like, do we want to be independent? Because they used to be independent, and then they were conquered, and then they've had all kinds of, you know, rebellions since then, and there was always kind of this enmity, and it's kind of like, Sometimes there'd be an alliance, then the alliance would break and back and forth. And for about uh, 300 or so years, 400 years, uh, Scotland has been, you know, a vassal state, essentially, to uh, Britain and the center of power being uh, in England. Uh, and the vote did not pass. Uh, they, they lost the referendum um, by a pretty, like a fairly small margin. It was mostly uh, senior citizens um, that that voted uh, no on that, and it was mostly young people who voted yes. And I wrote this article about, like, if Scotland wins independence, because it worked before this happened, what does that mean for anarchism? Is this a good sign? Because this was about the same time that uh, Catalonia was uh, talking about a vote uh, to secede from Spain, which I thought, you know, would be a great idea. And there were people in Scotland in the streets carrying Catalonian flags, the Catalan flags, and there were people in Catalonia carrying Scottish flags. And there was, like, this huge solid thing about like you know screw these empires screw these empires we're going to do our own thing and so i was like this is a fantastic idea right i think this is this is great um because murray rothbard you know has a quote about like uh, if, if one if there is no world government you know and you think that it's okay for one state to be independent of another state why can't you know uh, a state secede from the u.s and within that state, why can't, you know, uh, a city secede? And, and if that city secedes, why can't that neighborhood secede? And if that neighborhood secedes, why can't that household secede? So it's all down to the individual level. And I think that the more we break up these empires, you know, there is the potential, obviously, for tyranny at a local level. But like you said, Abraham Lincoln said, Secession is the essence of anarchy, and I really wish I quoted that. In my article. <laughs> I got the worst. I got the worst like reaction from a lot of people. I got some. I got some really good uh, reactions too. I got a lot of friends out of it, like on Facebook, you know, sending me messages like, "Man, I really love this article. Good job." Blah, blah, blah. But then I got some other people that were like, "You're not a real anarchist. You you just want more governments. This is going to be more government telling them what to do." And I was like, "Yeah, but." their own at least it's like historically at least it's their people it's not some person way over 
you know, granted it's, it's, only, it's like a few hundred miles, but still. It's slightly more localized. Right? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the um, that's the idea. I think Jeff Berg says, you know, we we ultimately won seven billion governments, <laughs> right? <laughs> Everybody owning themselves and um, taking full responsibility because that's absolutely what freedom is, right? Responsibility for your own actions, um, you know, building up good, um, you know, good connections and and rapport with other people, and that's that's the safety net that was. That was there before welfare, right? Before, right. before you know, subsidized housing and Medicaid and you know, it was being nice to people, yeah. <laughs> and then they'll be nice to you, <laughs> right? Yeah, I actually read uh, I actually read this piece for a political science class I took in my freshman year. I read this article by a very liberal, um, but he talked about like in detail U.S. history prior to like the 1960s, 1970s, that, you know, uh, war on poverty, what it was like, what charity was like before then, or what, you know, people relied on if they, you know, came on hard times. And for, I mean, it's not just American history. For all of history, people have had, you know, neighborhoods, um, you know, or just like one neighbor or whatever. Uh, and there was like almshouses and fraternal organizations. You know, there used to be, it wasn't just kind of like today you have like Knights of Columbus, uh, Shriners, Masons, and like, you know, a couple others here and there that are basically the only fraternal organizations anymore. And obviously they're huge. But there used to be in the U.S. there were hundreds. There were, there were like probably thousands of fraternities that maybe only had like 20 people. But what they would do is they would take care of someone that like um, – you know, if, if one of their members had a neighbor who was sick and couldn't, you know, uh, buy any groceries or whatever, they would have, like, a food drive or something to take to that person. It was all just based on kind of, like, who you knew and based on just people being, you know, kind. Kindness is revolutionary. Come on, we can't have that. We need we need radical uh, wealth right. redistribution. We need yeah, <laughs> legal I care, plunder. <laughs> I care about people just so much. I just want to point a gun at them and say, you need to care about people too. Just do it already. And just, you know, of course, I need to put them in jail if they don't because caring about people, you know. Yeah, it has to be a law. It has to be a law. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so can you go into your um, your Anarchy Never Been Tried series um, and discuss a little bit about you know some past anarchist uh, societies because that's that's some good fodder for for some anarchists. Yeah, uh, man, I've had so just so many people talk to me about this, and there's been pages that have reposted this in like Polish and like just oh. all around the world. Yeah, nice. Uh, uh, some I think Thai website or something posted something about it. <laughs> um, uh, basically. Um, I, I came across there's like a dearth of information about past anarchist societies and I was like there had to be there had to be a few come on no one's ever tried this really and I kept hearing this argument from people started out uh, I referenced this guy Sean in my first article he was a professor it was a teacher that I had in public school uh, definitely a liberal he didn't really make that too much of a secret um, <laughs> social studies and like history teacher so he's telling me you know like I would have these kind of like debates with him and he was he was a pretty open-minded guy, and he was like, oh, he was up for debate, um, but he always kind of had this smugness about him that was like, well, you're in high school, so of course you're going to be an anarchist. <laughs> so he was like, but it's never been tried. And I was like, okay, well, that, that's not an argument, actually, period. Uh, the abolition of slavery had never been tried so until someone did it. So... Um, so I was like, all right, I got to look this up in my free time. So I did. And I came across, I just, just found more and more and more. And there's even a Wikipedia page. Uh, it's like a list of stateless societies. And some people say, well, that's not really anarchism because it's not actively opposing government. But it's definitely at least, in most cases, it's at least evidence that government is not inevitable. Because that's basically... Uh, linked to that other argument that it's never been tried. Well, well, they say it's never been tried because the government always just springs into existence, um, which that idea was put forward by Rousseau. He was one of the first to put that forward, really, and Hobbes. Um, 
people in the Enlightenment kind of all across the board believed that because you need mutual protection, and you still hear this today, obviously, all the time, government just springs up one day. And people agree, well, uh, I really don't like the money that I have or the resources that I have, so why don't I just give it to someone else? That No, no, they get conquered, and then that becomes, mm-hmm. you know, government, and they get brainwashed. Mm-hmm. But some societies, that didn't happen. And in some societies, they expressly broke away from that tradition. So um, the first one in part one I talked about was neutral moresnet, uh, also called amakeo. Um, and that was basically all of the 19th century. Uh, it was a kind of micronation um, in the low countries in the Aachen forest uh, that was kind of a, a loophole in the Congress of Vienna in the treaty, I forget what it was, it was the treaty that ended the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so they were, it was a DMZ. So they said, if the German oppression empire steps in here, they declare war. If the Dutch empire steps in here, they declare war. If the French empire steps in here, they declare war. Uh, so this uh, is a what's, DMZ. Uh, what's a DMZ? What? Uh, demilitarize them. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so they said, you know, if, if some military member of these governments step in here, they declare war. So it was basically like a checks and balances thing, but it turned out to be a loophole because people already lived there. So they were like, they were like, no, no government has authority over this area. So the people living there were like, so I guess no government has authority over this area. That's pretty weird, right? So it's like, it's like 1800. They barely had any sort of government to speak of before that in these, this little village, basically. So they're living life as they lived it before, essentially. Um, but it became popular because you get into the age of imperialism and the age of you know, the 1800s, like uh, the age of these big empires, you know, like the Prussian Empire, and obviously the Empire, you know, it was getting bigger and bigger. So people started thinking about, and the, and the British Empire started thinking about, hey, I've heard of this place in Europe. I'm going to go check it out. So they just got, were the core like 40 years, the population exploded, and they had a zinc mine there that kind of turned into a boom town. So, like, you know, during the gold rush, you get all these towns that popped up around a mine. So that's essentially what happened. First, you got a bunch of investors that came in, people looking to sell zinc, and then the well, the, the mine dried up, but still the idea of it being a stateless country in this era, this modern state, um, and nationalism was massive that's like where it originated was about the 1840s um finding this place that no one had authority over at all free to do whatever you want um and it lasted for about 100 years and it became the world's kind of like first and only esperanto country um their official language they didn't really have one at all was mm-hmm. esperanto mm-hmm. i mean some people spoke it they had a bunch of uh, people who moved in who were Esperanto speakers looking to kind of start a movement there. And Amakeo in Esperanto means like place of friendship, I think. Um, and uh, they had this big celebration that was kind of like a big like nephew to the German Empire mm-hmm. um, because the German Empire didn't like Esperanto. The whole idea of it went completely against nationalism. So Awesome. And, yep. and, and and also uh, Ireland. You, you wrote about Ireland? Yeah, that one's been... Murray Rothbard wrote about that, too. I mean, that, that one's been written about, like... I shouldn't say extensively, because the average person obviously hasn't heard of it. Maybe a few volunteers have. Um, but Ireland was massively successful uh, without any sort of government to speak of. And there's been kind of like a conflation with historians. Um, a lot of historians think that they come across this term called, uh, I, I don't know really how to pronounce it exactly, but I think it's called Brian Law. Um, that's B-R-E-H-O-N. And they have these, they have these, it's basically like judges. It's a polycentric legal system. So if you've ever listened to like uh, David Friedman, this is like his bread and butter. Yeah. So The, the Machinery of Freedom video. Yeah. 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 So, so the way that that worked was essentially how the Irish uh, society worked. Um, where you'd have kind of judges uh, that did not really, uh, they, they weren't held to any sort of monopolistic, to any sort of legal monopoly. So 
it was essentially a competing court system, and the same type of deal was in Somalia, kind of still is, and then in the uh, in medieval Iceland, which uh, there was an article. I got a lot of that information from this article on Lou Rockwell. Um, I forget who it's by at the moment. Um, but there's actually there's a pretty good amount of scholarship on this stuff. It's just that people haven't come across it. It's more obscure, but it's really well founded. These people go into like a lot of people look into like you know uh, sources if there are any from these time periods, and it's a lack of evidence for any government that differentiates these places. Um, because someone asked me, I have I have an article about ancient, uh, essentially anarchist societies, um, and they say, you know, well, how do you, I was actually on the Ed and Ethan show, and he was kind of playing devil's advocate with that question, uh, and uh, they say, well, like, how do you know these places didn't have governments though? Because these sources are like thousands of years old, right? If there are any, so how do you know they didn't have a government? My answer at the time was like, I don't know, I'm not an archaeologist. They just, they just know. <laughs> I've figured out since then, uh, taking some kind of ancient art history courses and stuff, if you compare them to contemporary places at the time, uh, uh, you compare them to, say, the Babylonian Empire, uh, or ancient Egypt, or uh, the Akkadian Empire, or something like that, Persian Empire, you go to these places, you go to Persia, you go to... Uh, South, southern Iraq, you go to uh, like Syria and Egypt, and there's just a wealth of archaeology with references to kings and references to uh, uh, courts uh, and all sorts of things about, oh, well, this king succeeded this king and this king succeeded that king. Oh, and then in this era, this empire invaded and then this guy was our king. But in those societies, uh, which were Jericho, um, Harappa, and what was the third one? Uh, Chantal Hoyuk in Turkey. It was, a, it was more of a city. These places have no evidence of that. There's no evidence of any sort of ruler, which is like something that's a dead giveaway in these other places. You go, I mean, even in Turkey in ancient history, there are evi there is evidence of at least warlords or something. But in these places, nothing at all. No references to any sort of uh, general or anything like that. Wow, uh, awesome! Yeah. <laughs> have you have you ever read the book um, "The Market for Liberty" by Linda Tannehill? No, no. Um, I hear about it like just all the time. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I really got to read that. I really should. Oh, you would love it. it um, you know what it's about, right? It's uh, basically you know, it basically the whole thing is theorizing, right? How a voluntary society would work. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's similar to, uh, does Robert Murphy go into that in Chaos Theory? Um, I'm pretty sure. I think, you know what? I think that Medieval Iceland article was by Robert Murphy. I'm pretty oh, sure. It? Okay, okay. Yeah. So he's he's definitely, you know, well-versed on polycentric law and everything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, this is actually, I'm reading The Market for Liberty for the second time. Um, <laughs> it's really an awesome book. Uh, it was written in like the 70s, I think. Oh wow! Something like that, yeah. It's uh, I think it's reprinted again, you know, like uh, in the nineties or something. But, but yeah, extremely relevant. You know, that stuff is timeless. You know, yeah, um, yeah. It's just it's 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 just awesome theory that um, it, it's like you know what's funny when I talk to people about government, like um, or the hero of an attic is, <laughs> I'm like becoming like a uh, like a party favor at like family reunions and parties. <laughs> like, oh, Dan Danilo's an anarchist. Let's ask let's ask the anarchist something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sure. And like, what do you think about healthcare, or what do you think about you know the uh, I don't know foreign policy, or what about what about the monitor? What, what, what fiscal policy should we have? see? That's that's what I'm avoiding. That's what I'm like. <laughs> that's why you. That's why you keep quiet. <laughs> oh, it's, oh, it would happen. My family they talk about politics like every opportunity. Really? Oh yeah. But then again, they all they all agree with each other, so it's kind of just like an echo chamber. <laughs> I, I'm amazed at your uh, your uh, how do you say um, self restraint at not you know <laughs> saying something. <Yeah. laughs> Actually, that's the appeal to antiquity. <laughs> you, like you don't say anything <laughs> to try to rebut them at all. In like in like a kind of 
subversive way I will. I'll be like, you know, uh, they know I'm like a non-interventionist. They know I'm a libertarian, basically. Yeah. Um, but only I would say they think I'm a Ron Paul libertarian or something. Okay. Um, because I'm not, I'm not trying to like they. Oh man, they get so emotionally invested. <laughs> they get really like angry about these things, which is like something I find with a lot of like statists because they're just like talking to this like going really hard and they'll be right. Uh, because of this reason, and I just don't know, but America, you should love it, and like, um, you know, whatever the idea is. So, I'll be like, well, did you know that the U.S. just sold Iraq, like, chemical weapons to freaking bomb the Iranians and the Kurds? They were made in the West, <laughs> and they're just like, uh, well, you know, terrorism, 9-11, or whatever. <laughs> and, like, I can, I, I'm definitely, like, chipping away at them. I can definitely see that. But then they, during the day, of course, they'll listen to like uh, Tom Woods or whatever, or they'll watch Fox News. Or not Tom Woods, they'll listen to um, Glenn Beck and they'll watch Fox News. Uh, I apologize to Tom Woods, I'm sorry. He has a slip. Yeah. Oh, man, he's probably seen it. Um, <laughs> both of them. So, so they listen to, like, obviously, uh, Rush Limbaugh. Um, they like... So it's... It's like I'm trying to fight this like subversive like psychological battle with like, well, did you know actually that free banking is like a fantastic alternative to, uh, you know, the U.S. monetary system and Bitcoin is just like you know they know all about Bitcoin but they think it's some kind of like hokey like, you know, electronic devil money you know the like the Antichrist is going to get into your electronic yeah. wallet and yeah. imprint you with like some microchip and then. Uh, Obviously, they don't like paper money. They don't like fiat money because that's become like a uh, kind of conservative position these days. I guess you could say a conservatarian type position is to oppose the Fed. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, but like, you mean it's a cool thing? Yeah, because like, <laughs> what's that? You mean it's the cool thing to oppose the Fed, but but not really understand why? Yeah, yeah. Rick Perry. No, no, not a, not in the least. And Rick Perry is like, I think we should, you know, abolish the Fed or whatever. <laughs> 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 Whoa, Rick Perry, you need to calm down. And people ask him, well, why do you think that? Oh, because, uh, yeah, paper, money, it's bad. It's, I don't know. Because <laughs> they, they have a fundamental mistrust of the government, but they don't have a mistrust of government. The idea of government. Yeah, of course. They, they love it. They cling to it. It's like their lifeline, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, the, the problem is when people ask um, me about you know, specific issues, specific bills, specific laws, um, you know, you're immediately assuming that um, government is legitimate when you do that, right? You need, when you ask about these things. So right. it's important to start on a completely, um, you know, philosophical level. Like, I oppose coercion and, you know, force <laughs> in society. I think we can do without force, right? And, you know, you support self-ownership and non-aggression. And you go from there, then... Uh, things become a little more clear, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and definitely, that's something that takes people off guard, and I've done that, um, like, with people I meet and stuff, or people I talk to on Facebook or whatever. Um, like, well, if you're an anarchist, then uh, what do you think about, um, you know, just any issue, be, like healthcare or something, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, I think everyone should have it, but I don't think that it's very nice to just point guns at people i mean you wouldn't want to do that would you point a gun at like let alone your neighbor some guy you didn't know like a stranger do you have any empathy because that's what it's all based on for a lot of the liberal arguments at least is like empathy like well don't you care about the poor <laughs> yeah, right. i do care about the poor enough to like not force them to pay for anything yeah the appeal to emotion right or appeal to, to appeal to pity I, I i hear that a lot like oh yeah you know uh, what about the what about the person who's like working three jobs can't sleep have they have kids you don't think they need help from the government <laughs> you know and i'm like i'm like I, I you know what i can't worry about every single person all right i only can worry about myself and the general principle is you know when you when you remove coercion from the equation, when you remove you know violent wealth redistribution, yeah. <laughs> when you remove intergenerational debt, and yeah. you know debt slavery, things will change. <laughs> yeah, and do they do they think it's like, do they think these programs work? 
have ever worked. I mean, mm-hmm. like people will be surprised that like, you know, there was that the myth of the of the Scandinavian miracle or whatever it's called. It's like this really great article that's been going around. I think it's published on the Independent. Um uh, I may be wrong, but it was like this whole the myth of Scandinavian socialism, that's what it's called. Um how the welfare states in Europe, especially obviously France, France is like, you know, uh just complete chaos as far as that goes. <laughs> and Greece, you know, is like not even worth mentioning. Um, so uh, even in Scandinavia, people are like, well, did you know in Scandinavia they have like free health care? And did you know that like everybody's really happy there? And like minimum wage is like $50 an hour? Like, well, there's just so many things wrong with that. But even if it were, even if they did have all those fantastic things, like, is it really worth just being like, well, you need to pay for this, so I'm just going to send, like, if you don't want to pay for it for whatever reason, they think it's better to just send a bunch of armed, basically, police to someone's house and force them to pay for welfare so the country can have a higher happiness. <laughs> or whatever. Happiness by force. <laughs> right, you know, oh, it's like, basically you know brave new world or something of course like, yeah yeah and and that that example kind of rings particularly uh close to home for me because i have uh, one of my aunts she lived in france for a long time even like 14 years something like that and so she moved um to here in the united states she, she moved to boston uh like maybe like uh, uh eight years ago so and uh and she's always saying about you know in France free uh, where they have free healthcare, free college. It's so wonderful, you know. <laughs> and, oh yeah. And and I, I remember talking to some people. I remember talking to this one couple who came from uh, Germany, right? And the, and the woman was like, "It's so wonderful, free this, free that." And the guy says, "It's not free. <laughs> we pay for that, but not directly." <laughs> we, right. Someone's paying for it, and including you. But everyone else, people pay for this. And I, I, I tried to get this idea. I have, I have this Italian professor. And uh, um, he's been in the States for a long time. But he goes back to Italy like every year uh, and teaches sometimes there. So he's like, well, you know, in Italy, uh, educa- you know, they have free college. And he thinks it's just like, he thinks it's, it's just like this horrible idea that, that college isn't free here. And I was like, but it's not actually free. You know that, right? Like, you know it's not free are you like you're kidding you know? <laughs> and actually i'm uh I have, I have also a friend um uh, my my wife's uh old um friend from from university he lives in italy now and and i was actually talking to him recently on on facebook and he because i posted about the police in an article i wrote about the police and how you know if you told somebody that you have to you're forced to pay for something against your will that you never asked for regardless if you want it or not you would you would understand that that's theft or coercion right yeah but when it's taxes and when it's police we don't kind of see that and then and then he he commented he's like that sounds like the italian mafia you know we have the italian mafia over here i'm like that's not just in italy <laughs> <That's-> <laughs> the government is a mafia it's just that the mafia is worse at being a government <laughs> like, um, yeah, I, I know. I, I, I was thinking of this like in my Italian class. I think of it all the time, actually. But I'm like, if some if some guy came up to you, you know, with a gun of some kind, you know, and was like, uh, "Give me all your money," you know, into your wallet. You're like, okay, so this is a mugging, right? And he said, "Oh, don't worry. <laughs> I'm making sure this money goes to a good cause, and we're all going to vote on it. We're all going to vote on where your where, where your money is going." I'd be like, no. No, no, this is not what's happening. Or, you know, obviously if I was getting mugged, I'd be like, okay. Stop resisting arrest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but for some reason, it just magically becomes, like, okay when he's, like, senator, whatever, and he's got a little name tag, you know, whatever. So I was, I, I've been, I was trying to kind of, like, get to my Italian professor, like, philosophically, and the idea, these ideas just, like, can't occur in his head. Because especially in Europe society and government are thought of to be like the same thing and tax resistance in Europe for any other reason than, uh, than pacifism is like unheard of. So he was like, well, if you don't pay your taxes, you don't care about people. Mm. (laughs) I'm like, but if you want taxes, you don't care about people. (laughs) 
yeah yeah and then and then people um you know are, are so happy for all the uh, wonderful services we get you know that for, oh, yeah. for, for from the taxes you know like the roads you know we can't have road we can't have roads if it wasn't for you know yeah. a violent extortion racket you know we absolutely need that there's some things right. in the world you just have to put up with right which would be impossible i mean <laughs> how do you put the pavement down and <laughs> The road has the ground has to be flat or something. I've been told that there has to be stripes or something. <laughs> it's just it's, the technology is just blowing my mind. I'm like, you know that people in the private sector are making like bionic arms. They can make bionic arms yeah. that work when you think about it. That like work with your brain, but they can't build a road. Roads are just yeah totally beyond their capacity in the private. <laughs> Yeah, so so two things come to mind when I talk to people about that. Like, like my grandfather likes to tell me, um, you know, the government is efficient. Like, it produces things like, you know, like, that research a lot of things. They invent a lot of things. Isn't that wonderful? And and, and, I, and I'm thinking that, no, it doesn't, actually. Uh, the, the government itself, the idea of government is just force. That's it. It forces these people... It, if it, it forces these people to give up their money to give to those people to make something, right? The government right. doesn't actually make something, right? It's it's basically just given to special interest groups um, <laughs> to do that or yeah. or contractors well, and things like that. Right. I mean, uh, and even if it were, you know, uh, some fantastic discovery done with government funds, you know, uh, you know, the Nazis were the people who figured out cigarettes cause cancer. So... <laughs> Like whoop de do, a government found out something someone could have found out like by themselves. Yeah. What do you think? No one's gonna put money into it. If if people pay taxes to put money into research, they would just do it themselves directly. <laughs> There's if they care about research, they would still care about research without the third party. Yeah, yeah. So the whole idea of legitimacy that um, that and that's what separates government from the mafia is that you know the mafia does not have legitimacy. Its its threats and commands are just that threats and commands of violence, right? Whereas the government, these threats and commands are called laws, right? The extortion is called taxation, right? Because it has legitimacy in the minds of the people, and they absolutely cheer when there's a new master every four or six years, right? <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean. Uh... I mean, and and he, and in the U.S. especially, it like blows my mind that it's just just two just two parties just going back and forth basically <laughs> for like two hundred years, yeah. you know. Because why change anything? Because you know, but like come on. Yeah. And then and then, but at the same time, I mean, my Italian professor is like, well, you know, in Europe we have uh, the European Parliament has you know uh, like twenty parties or something, you know, and in, in Italy we have like six or seven parties and. He's all, oh, well, you can vote for more than just the two parties. I mean, the U.S. is so corrupt because there's only two parties. Like, mm -hmm. You're not getting this at all, though. And their <laughs> country is screwed. Italy is completely screwed right now. Yeah. Like, they're, they're about to, they're asking for an IMF bailout because of all their free college and their, their free college and then their uh, free housing and everything mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a ticking time bomb, and and actually, you know, talking about the monetary system, that's what actually what got me into volunteerism is the precious metals and and learning about the Federal Reserve and you know quantitative easing and uh, currency creation, Mandrake mechanism, and uh, that's usually how I that's usually how I get into talking to people. Like like do do you like how do you talk to people when you introduce these topics to like friends or just you know other people you meet on the street or something? Um, that that is sometimes it because. Uh, there are a lot of people who the kind of overlap of just general people who don't trust, you know, uh, the monetary system and uh, the banking system. And everything. Yeah, there is a big overlap there. Um, another one that I come across is uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, that's a big one uh, because a lot of people, you know, hate American foreign policy. It's like the worst foreign policy in history. It's a complete like suicide pact. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something that definitely gets people talking about the whole general idea uh, of government. Um, uh, something that I that has gotten some people talking is just I'll tell them like some strangers over outright like oh by the way I'm an anarchist or whatever. No like <laughs> Are you, you, the whole the whole tone of the conversation just which is and they're like what. So, it's like, where, where's your uh, where's your bandana and your Molotov? <laughs> right, right. 
or like I, I was in school and like uh for they'll have these you know beginning of the semester icebreakers in the class you know like say your name and something interesting about you <laughs> like uh, Daniel um and occasionally I'll just I'll just feel like throwing it out there sometimes we'll just say something else but if I feel like just throwing it out they'll be like I'm an anarchist and they'll be like <laughs> what? So then they'll be like, well, if you're an, why do we, what do you think of this and that? People are super interested in it, but in like this weird, like, they think there's some kind of like deviance because they're like, well, is it making sense right now? This is so weird. <laughs> should, should, should I be liking this or not liking this? Right, exactly. <laughs> should I be impressed or scared? <laughs> Which... <laughs> and, that, oh, and of course, most people have this idea that like, oh, this guy is so naive. He doesn't, oh, come on. Like, you're just like rebellious and stuff. But especially though, once I get into like economics, I'll be like, well, actually, you know, I'm an anarcho capitalist. So they're like, I've never heard of that in my life. Yeah. 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 yeah, so yeah. They, uh, yeah ec- economics is, is a good way to do it because that's a little bit less uh, threatening <clears throat> to people when you just, when you just, you know, show your understanding of human action and the way, you right. know, you know, supply and demand works, competition works, you know. And just by that, you know, um, you can you can make a path towards um, anarchy and volunteer. Oh yeah, and, right? and another one was a uh, is a uh, corporations and special interests and stuff. So if I'm talking to someone, they're like, you know, uh, I really don't like uh, Walmart or McDonald's or whatever have you, you know, some or Monsanto or some some big, you know, whatever name your company that is doing something nefarious. You know, they're like. Or, uh, oh, did you know that this senator got this amount of donations from Northrop Grumman? Um, and, you know, we really need to get money out of politics and blah, blah, And, you know, corporations are even like, did, did you know that government is the thing that keeps them alive? Like, mm-hmm. governments invented corporations in the 1700s as joint stock companies. It was... They would hold, it was essentially owned by the government. Uh, in the Netherlands, it was a little bit more privatized. But ultimately, it's always been something. You incorporate through the government. You get limited liability most of the time. And all of it is a legal structure without, without subsidies and things like that. You know, people say, well, did you know Nestle got X amount in subsidies? And now they're you know, helping cause this big drought in California. Like, yeah, but Nestle got those subsidies because the government gave them the subsidies. Without the subsidies, they couldn't be profitable. Like, mm-hmm. people, if you starve a company, if you boycott a company enough, you can, you know, vote with your wallet. What the government does when they give people subsidies or, you know, whatever, uh, free utilities or uh, eminent domain land or something, is they're fighting your vote with your wallet with their money but it's, i mean the whole system is propped up by the government without it what we would have is a free market and you meet a lot of leftists who are very much against like corporations and corporatism but they think it's capitalism and then once you explain to them no the absence of government is a free market what we have now is actually you know a mixed economy which is essentially a neo-fascist mm-hmm. economy and it completely blows their mind and, like most of the time or they get really mad or whatever <laughs> Yes, because anger solves all problems, right? <laughs> so I don't want to keep you too long. Um, so why don't you, uh, wrapping up, can you just give a, a message that um, you know you would like people to hear, maybe if they're just getting started in this, in this topic, or you know, what, what would be a, a, a simple message you would give them? <laughs> well, I mean, if you're just, if you're just jumping into this, wow. Well, uh, or, or, or to somebody that you, know, you, want to, you want to plant a seed, maybe. Okay. Um, I mean, just ask yourself, like, when you think of a new law or something, people do this a lot. They're like, well, there should be a law that people shouldn't be allowed to blah, blah, blah. <laughs> something they don't, they don't happen to like. You know, I think people shouldn't be allowed to sag their pants or something. Like, would you be willing to just, like, buy a gun, go up to that person, and be like, you're not allowed to do this? Yourself. Like, would you do it yourself? Because you're just asking someone else to do it. If they disobey that law, they'll get arrested. What, what is being arrested? Being arrested is having a gun shoved in your face. You're cuffed because you violated the opinion of some person. But they won't do it themselves, of course, because, you know, they don't want to because they have, like, emotions and, like, empathy and stuff. So if you think you have emotions and empathy and that kind of thing, if 
you're genu- if you genuinely care about other people or if you're on the right side of the spectrum, if you care about Americans and that you think there should be some law, are you willing to find someone you disagree with and threaten to kill them or put them in a, in, you know, tie them up in your basement or something and, and engage them up for doing something you just don't like? Is this really what you want? Yes, exactly. You know, and, and the, the, the word force, I like to use a lot when I talk about government, but many people don't associate force with government because they don't want to see the gun in the room, right? It's, it's very convenient not to see the gun. So it's very good. It's very important that we bring that up constantly, you know, and, and I, always, I always like to do that. So awesome conversation, Daniel. Thank you very much for, you. for coming on. Um, so, so, so just to let everyone know, if you really enjoy this content, please um, donate. I have a PayPal um, link and uh, you can also donate Bitcoin. I accept all forms of value. If you want to barter, no problem. <laughs> Just send it to me. I'll, find, I'll figure out a, get, a way to get it. So <laughs> that's not a problem. So um, awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Conscious Resistance.com and the Seeds of Liberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. <laughs>